Greetings. Uh, this session is recorded or re-recorded for our class in CSC 239, Module 4, We're talking about uh, scientific method and statistics, an introduction to statistics. Essentially, we started off the session by explaining that for many, when investigations um, and experiments are conducted, they often uh, reveal a pattern where um, a person can make an educated guess. The term hypothesis comes to mind, right? You may have heard this before. What often happens is that uh, the people performing the investigations often skip a step. It's a common mistake. But what they should do is translate the hypothesis into a prediction. So the value of a hypothesis, that educated guess, is that it's a it's a hunch about how uh, a relationship between two quantities or qualities uh, exists, and if your hunch is correct, you should be able to predict some outcomes and then perform trials or experiments. You're proving the prediction. You're not really proving the hypothesis. So. Investigations are intended to validate predictions based on a hypothesis. And eventually, if that's done often enough with uh, reliability and, vo and validity, then you may end up having, uh, you may, may come up, you may be able to draft what's known as a theory, right? And theories can be proven or disproven with repeated experiments. Now, this is a subtle but profound distinction. The whole linchpin around this idea though everything that um, this, this whole thing depends uh, very uh, very greatly on the idea that that the the activities and trials can be repeated by others or similar activities and trials can be repeated by others and uh, you have outcomes with with you know, significant levels of consistency. So that's an important aspect of, of experimental method. Now, uh, it's worth stating again that uh, it's really important to have um, a method, uh, an intended way of, of um, logging and collecting the data, but also uh, you have to have you have to have notes. You have to basically be sure that there are records of of what's performed and how it's performed. Moving right along in our second student learning objective, we want to focus on the two kinds of data used for statistical analysis. So according to statistical experts, there are two kinds of statistical data used for analysis, discrete, and continuous. Discrete data are clearly and cleanly defined into categories. Yes or no, it's either one thing or another, moving or rest. So it's a state of motion. You're either in a state of motion or at rest. Could another quality that's uh, discrete could be the months of the year or the days of the week, the species of an animal, the sex of an animal. Though continuous, uh, continuous data is different. It's measured using a continuum or a range of values, and it typically involves the use of a finely graduated scale of incremental measurements, so height, mass, and temperature. A quick example of the difference between these two is that if you had a solid object, a state of mass, which is a discrete data, it's a, and it was at room temperature, and you could measure the room temperature precisely at 78.3 degrees Fahrenheit, you would have information or data about that object. You would have discrete data about its physical state or the state of its matter. And you'd have continuous data about its temperature. So the two types of statistical data. Um, this is an important point too. When we talk about the two forms of statistical data or two kinds of statistical data 
We don't want to confuse those with data types used for coding attributes in a development environment when we're creating a custom application. The terms to identify these data types in a programming environment, such as integer, real, boolean, or string, that's, that's a different context altogether. So when we're talking about statistics, we're really talking about the two kinds or two forms of data. And it's probably best not to use the word type, just to keep from getting confused with data types that might be used for programming. That's just an important uh, tip. So what we'd like to do is look first at uh, some essentials for descriptive statistical analysis. So just as there are two kinds of data to collect, measure, and analyze, there are two kinds of statistical analysis, descriptive and inferential. And we'll look at the descriptive first. So descriptive statistical analysis is more com concrete or absolute in terms. The results are rendered um, by standard or customary uh, methods, it's largely numerical in nature. Uh, they're absolutes. These methods can quantify precisely the characteristics of a data, a single data set, right? And then you can compare between data sets. For example, the average of numerical values for a range, right? You can also, you can also uh, quantify the distribution of values for a data set. And those may reflect what's referred to as a normal distribution. The distribution of values can also vary or deviate from the norm in predictable ways that statisticians have standardized using common calculations, right? Variance and standard deviation and so on. To clearly define those dimensions, examples of such standard uh, descriptive statistical methods include ones that you've likely heard before, bell curves, standard deviations, and quartiles. And though it's the representation of these calculations that can be most helpful, it's actually the graphical representation of the outcomes that can reveal the most significant patterns, especially where outliers are concerned. And when we say the term outlier, we're talking about an obvious exception to a common pattern, right? So we might expect a certain pattern, but if there's an exception of that, um, then it's, it's pretty obvious. So... For the most ideal case, when you have uh, random values um, where there is is no um, there's no influence, uh, there's nothing to skew this thing. Uh, basically, 68.2 percent of the values for a given data set are represented within one deviation of the mathematical average. This is a statistical norm that was identified years ago by statisticians. And that means that roughly 95% of values lie within two standard deviations compared to the average or mean, right? So this, would, what we, this is what we meant by uh, normal uh, distribution. However, when you're doing measurements and you're recording observations, you're collecting and organizing data about a population of objects, you basically have uh, exceptions and those exceptions or outliers may include skewness <clears throat> which has to do with um, a slant right so you have a slant here you notice this that's skewness um, when there's a deviation from what's a, a normal distribution of uh, data points for a given population of uh, measurements or, or items you can have this uh, deviation. So there are tests for norm, what's called normality. If there's a normal distribution of data for a given set of measurements, then it's, it's pretty predictable. But if it's different, um, the different tests for normality include this idea of skewness. Now you can also have something called kurtosis, which has to do with how, how much taller or how much flatter a distribution is. So you can have skewness and kurtosis as additional tests for normality when you're performing uh, these calculations. And that helps us understand um, the, the pattern with, with better definition, right? So when things, 
are not presented in a not if they, when things are presented in a not so normal way, just remember there are different ways to represent graphically what's going on. Um, you can include uh, details in a graphical representation of data. One one that's popular is uh, range that is represented by a box and whisker plot. We'll have more on this later. But this is a, a matter of descriptive statistics, and a box and whisker plot will include um, the average point on a range represented by a line with endpoints. So, and where the greatest distribution of those points exists, there's a box. So it looks like a box with whiskers on, on the sides. Sometimes those are represented vertically, and so it's not so obvious that you're dealing with a box and whisker plot because the whiskers aren't horizontal, they're vertical. Let's take a look at some inferential statistic analysis. So just as we said there were two kinds of data, discrete and continuous, there are two types of statistical analysis. We've just covered the descriptive, and what we'd like to do now is take a look at some essentials for inferential statistical analysis. So inferential analysis is less concrete or hypothetical in terms of the results rendered. And it's based on the probability or likelihood that there is a distinct pattern, right? You want to be able to generalize or infer the existence of a relationship, whether that's proportional or inversely proportional, whether there's a correlation, right? And in particular, there's a useful frame of reference with inferential statistics, and it's a concept known as the null hypothesis. Now, the null hypothesis, that, that type of hypothesis is not the same as the general term used for the scientific method. Rather, it's a, it's a specific term used in inferential statistical analysis, and a null hypothesis is the conclusion that two or more data sets are in no way related to each other, that a generalization about how they may be related is simply not possible because the analysis of selected data elements reflects something that is totally and completely random. Now, let's suppose, for example, uh, we wanted to see if there was a relationship between the sex of swimmers at a popular beach and the nationality of swimmers at the same beach, right? This would be an example of something that is completely random and not related because those things can vary widely. And there's no pattern to how those things are related. Now, there could be an exception. We could have a case where a beach is restricted solely for the use by Swedish males. And in such case, the beach would require swimmers to present valid passports to validate uh, nationality and valid ID to confirm sex of a swimmer. But this would mean the population of swimmers is hardly random, that, it's, that there is a relationship between those criteria. And the requisite um, criteria are basically a part of um, access to that beach. Now, if that were the case, you'd basically say, well, okay, we have uh, nothing but Swedish and nothing but males, and uh, there is something that is not so random uh, going on here. So, so that's the whole idea of a null hypothesis. When you're performing inferential statistical methods, the goal is to identify that something is either totally and completely random, and there's no relationship whatsoever, or to validate that there is some kind of relationship or correlation, right? In the natural world, things are not so plain. So quite often data elements in a data set are related. And um, this is represented by what statistical experts call a working or alternative hypothesis. So if the inferential statistical analysis proves that there is a non-random uh, occurrence, we're talking about an alternative hypothesis or a working hypothesis for how two things are related. So you could have a quick example here of how rainfall increases just as plant growth increases, right? So as you measure increases in rainfall, plant growth increases, decreases rainfall, plant growth decreases. And so most people understand 
uh, when these similarities are identified. But sometimes uh, what's what's not so obvious is identifying a relationship that's inverse. When there's a difference where things are uh, inversely related as opposed to directly related. So in the case of rainfall and plant growth, those are directly related or proportional relationships, correlations. Now, this is something that takes a while to wrap your head around, so it's probably a good idea to just reflect on this for a while. A consistent difference is not at all random, right? So a lot of budding scientists conclude prematurely that it is only the similarities that deflect that reflect a discovery, but once again, inverse relationships can be profound. And um, I mean, the history of science is uh, is full of those. Now, useful attributes rendered by inferential statistics include what's called a p-value to gauge error and an r-factor. The R factor reflects the likelihood of a relationship or a correlation, what's referred to as a correlation. Most statisticians define that a p-value of less than 0.05 reflects a case that manifests some type of relationship. That means that there's it's not random. So if there's a p-value of less than 0.05, a p-value of higher than that tends to confirm a greater likelihood that a null hypothesis is valued. A null hypothesis meaning, okay, things are random. The closer to one that a calculated r-factor is, the greater confidence a researcher can claim about selected aspects of a relationship. Okay, And there's another inferential method called regression analysis. So if it Points, if the data points trace a highly consistent line that shows no slope, this affirms the absence of a relationship, either proportional or inverse. So these are things that you'll begin to understand as you apply them in our assignments and solutions. The important thing to remember is that there are no absolute conclusions that can be drawn from inferential statistical methods, only inferences. And most often these may imply a correlation between uh, two uh, qualities, but, but that doesn't prove what's called a cause and effect relationship or causality. That's a whole different level of, of statistical proof. So those are some things to understand. Now, in our next objective, we just wanted you to be able to explain how the null hypothesis is different from a scientific hypothesis. We've just been over that. We reviewed the two types of influential, or I'm sorry, uh, two types of inferential statistical analyses, right? And uh, the two forms of statistical data, discrete and continuous. And one of the things that's really important to be able to do is to uh, determine which inferential statistical method is a a best fit for a given scenario. So when it comes to descriptive statistics, uh, those are those are pretty um, straightforward numerical um, analysis and calculation methods. But when you're talking about uh, inferential statistical analysis, it's it's really important to look at the scenario and then based on the scenario to find the right method. When to use which method of inferential statistical analysis. So I'm going to change that header so it reads uh, method. It's important to determine first what type or what form of data you're using, discrete or continuous. And then once you know which type of uh, data you're working with, uh, the other thing that is an important factor in determining the inferential statistical method is to determine whether a quantity is an independent variable, it's an independent uh, quantity uh, represented by an independent variable, or it's a dependent uh, quantity, or dependent represented by a dependent variable uh, separate. The independent variable is the one 
that's changed or controlled quite often, right? And it generates a result or a change in the dependent variable. So the outcomes of the dependent variable are dependent upon what happens with the independent variable. Let's repeat that. The independent variable is the one that's changed or controlled, and the outcomes of the dependent variable are um, result from the changes that are, are induced in the independent variable. So you, if you change or manipulate or control the independent variable, um, let's say that we increase uh, heat input in matter. So we apply more heat to a state of matter. Um, if we remove heat or add heat, we could say that heat in calories is the independent variable. If we're measuring temperature, temperature would change as a result. So the temperature would depend on the application or removal of heat from the matter of that object, right? So essentially, uh, temperature would be a dependent variable. So it's important to be able to understand the two different forms of statistical data, discrete and continuous, but it's also important to understand the scenario, independent or dependent. So the dependent variable is the data element that requires measurement of output. By changing inputs and measuring the nature of outputs, scientists can more precisely determine or define how a dependent variable depends upon the input, the inputs of the independent variable. Now that's a kind of an oversimplification of the case, but it's a it's a component of inferential statistical analysis that that you need to have a very clear grasp of. So at the end of the day, you have to know whether or not some something is a discrete form of, of statistical data or continuous. And you have to know if it's the dependent or independent variable. Now doing that allows us to use uh, a simple cheat sheet, which uh, has been provided by those who teach statistics in this case uh, we have a cheat sheet that's been provided courtesy of uh, Steve, Dr. Steve in uh, the biology department. And uh, essentially, Dr. Ratchford has a simple matrix here that you can use to determine which inferential tests or methods are best suited for a given scenario. And there's a very simple process that you use to follow this cheat sheet. So essentially, you identify which variable is the independent variable and which one's the dependent variable. And so the independent variable is represented by the columns in this table. The dependent variable is represented by the rows in this table. And then you determine whether each independent or dependent variable uh, takes the form of discrete or continuous data types. So if the dependent variable uh, uses a discrete form of data, then you're dealing with the top row here. And you'll notice that if the independent variable also uses a discrete form of statistical data, then the method that's best suited to perform analysis of, of uh, inference, right? Inferential statistics would be the chi-square test. Um, now that's not an absolute, but this is just a, a simple way of, of narrowing down which tests are most appropriate for which challenges and, and work best, right? So um, let's take another case. Let's say that the independent variable used a discrete form of statistical data and the dependent variable used was was a continuous form of statistical data. In that case you could use the, what's called a t-test or ANOVA, ANOVA uh, to perform analysis to determine 
whether you have a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis. So that's a, a simple case. If you have, notice here there's a big X. So if you have an independent variable that has continuous data and a dependent variable that's measured using a discrete form of statistical data, um, well, you can't, there is no um, quick um, method of inferential statistics listed here that, that you could use, right? So that's an important exception here. That's why this is X'd out. So that's when the independent variable is continuous and the dependent variable is discrete. That's important to understand. The last case is when you have continuous forms of statistical data, both for the independent variable and for the dependent variable. So for on this column here for continuous, and we're on this row for continuous on the dependent variable side of things, what we're looking at is an intersection between the column and row right here. So you can run uh, a regression correlation analysis or linear regression uh, to determine whether or not there's uh, a relationship there. So that's the inferential method that you can use where both independent variable and dependent variable are continuous forms of statistical data. All right, well, that concludes our uh, recording for this portion of our Module 4 material. Uh, we'll pick up the trail in our next session with modeling and what-if scenarios.